ನಾರಾಯಣ ನಮಸ್ಕೃತ್ಯ ನರಂ ಚೈವ ನರೋತ್ತಮ ದೇವಿ ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ವ್ಯಾಸ ತಯಂಬುದೀರೇತ್ ಓಂ ನಮೋ ಭಗವತೆ ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ ಓಂ ನಮೋ ಭಗವತೆ ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ ಓಂ ನಮೋ ಭಗವತೆ ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ ಹರೆ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಸೊ ವಿ ಕಂಟಿನ್ಯೂಯಿಂಗ್ ಅ ಡಿಸ್ಕಶನ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಶ್ರೀಮದ್ ಭಾಗವತಂ ಅಂಡ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ದಿ ಥರ್ಡ್ ಕ್ಯಾಂಟೋ and we concluded chapter 5 the previous session and now we are moving on to chapter 6 and before we move into chapter 6 chapter 6 begins the description of the gist of shrimad bhagavatam received by shri maitreya rishi and shri uddhava from krishna just before his past times on the planet became unmanifest just before his departure from the leela that is manifest he instructed shri maitre rishi and he instructed shri vidura sorry shri uddhava about the gist of shrimad bhagavatam so what we need to do when we read shrimad bhagavatam is for us to constantly revisit the gist and if we revisit the gist then it becomes very contextual in terms of what krishna is wanting to convey if we read the chapters of shrimad bhagavatam in isolation then what does happen is that the gist of shrimad bhagavatam which was conveyed by krishna to these great personalities it was conveyed by krishna to lord brahma before the process of creation begins it was conveyed by naranarayan rishi to shri narad muni shri narad muni conveyed it to um uh, vyasadev and vyasadev conveyed it to shila sukadev goswami and then you know the different personalities who participated in the rendition of shrimad bhagavatam by shila sukadev goswami now if you notice that there is a consistent approach in terms of summarizing the entire teachings of the bhagavatam into a gist form which is being shared and as the gist is meditated upon then because shrimad bhagavatam is the personification of the lord there's no difference between shrimad bhagavatam and krishna then shrimad bhagavatam unfolds like a lotus would unfold and then reveals the details of the rest of shrimad bhagavatam from the gist depending on the motivation and depending on the maturity of the individual the details are revealed and as a consequence one is able to realize shrimad bhagavatam now the point is the gist was revealed to shila vyasadev so he had the gist and he meditated and the entire shrimad bhagavatam was manifest in his heart and even before he wrote or rather produced the shrimad bhagavatam it was in his heart and he kept the gist of shrimad bhagavatam and the manifestation of shrimad bhagavatam from that gist without revealing and used that as a foundation for the vedanta sutra the vedanta sutra practically is the foundation for the primary vaishnava sampradayas every one of the vaishnava sampradayas including the sampraday of shri shankaracharya all of them have commented on the vedanta sutra but then shri mad bhagavatam was the source of the vedanta sutra so shri chaitanya mahaprabhu did not feel that there was a need for a commentary because shri mad bhagavatam the inspiration of shri mad bhagavatam in the heart of shri lavyasadev was the source for the entire vedanta sutra now the point which we are trying to make here is that the gist is like a lotus and the lotus unfolds based on the individual and their touch with spiritual reality the gist was given to lord shri brahma and then lord brahma sat down and he meditated and engaged in tapasya and he engaged in the chanting process for 1000 years and as he sat and chanted for 1000 years the lotus of the gist unfolded and everything that krishna wanted him to understand was practically revealed through the process of watering that particular bija in the heart with the holy names and with the mantra that lord brahma received and as a consequence he received what he had to receive for him to be consistent with the original teachings and the original intention of the lord 
So the original intention of the Lord is being captured in the gist. In a similar fashion, as devotees of Lord Chaitanya, those, who, those of us who are participating in the movement of Lord Chaitanya, the gist of Srimad Bhagavatam is in our hearts. And then as we water the gist with the chanting of Harinam, then the gist unfolds and then everything is revealed in great detail and we are able to proceed further. Now, in the previous session, we spoke about the fact that the intention of our Acharyas, those of us, those Acharyas who came in the lineage of Lord Chaitanya, their primary intention is to remove Nama Prad and to give Sambandha Gyan. So Sambandha Tattva, which is to introduce the devotee, introduce the soul to the relationship between the soul and Krishna. And then in the process of introduction, removing the obstacles, which are basically the aparad that is committed, is the primary motivation of all the literature that has been authored by our predecessors, you know, whoever has come in the lineage of Lord Chaitanya. They have offered this for the purpose of removing the anarthas, for the purpose of removing the uh, the misconceptions and eventually being able to give faith, which is pure faith, and which is to offer that Sambandha Tattva between us and Krishna in the eternal realm of Raja. What is the specific relationship? That relationship is being revealed and Aparad is being removed. And that is the whole purpose of all the literature that has been written. Now, that is also the primary objective of Srimad Bhagavatam. Because everything that's been written and everything that's been offered to us are realizations of the Guru Parampara. These are realizations of Srimad Bhagavatam. Srimad Bhagavatam is the foundation of realizations. It is the foundation of all scripture, of everyone who has come in the line of Lord Chaitanya. This is our primary text. And as a consequence, they develop realizations. And then those realizations will have their foundation in Srimad Bhagavatam, practically. This is how it was done. Now, Srimad Bhagavatam is the personification of Krishna, just as much as Nam is the personification of Krishna. Nama, Naminoho, Abhinnatvam. There's no difference between Krishna and his name. The name would manifest Nama, Rupa, Guna, Leela. All of this would manifest, and over a period of time, as Aparad, leaves our heart and different kinds of anarthas leave our heart slowly and steadily nam will unfold and nam which is not different from krishna would reveal itself in its full glory and then the same nam which is sadhana becomes the goal which is also the sadhya so someone has just begun chanting the hare krishna maha mantra and they have just begun chanting the Hare Krishna Mahamantra today. This is the first opportunity. Now for them, this is sadhana. And then there are those who have attained the fruits of Sambandha Tattva, where they have attained a complete knowledge of the relationship with Krishna. And they are chanting in loving emotions. They are chanting in bhav. They are chanting you know, in the beginning stages of prema, they're chanting in the more mature stages of prema. So what we are noticing is that the process is the same. Everybody, whether you're coming in for the first day or you are here in terms of attaining the fruits of Krishna consciousness, the ultimate goal of Krishna consciousness, everybody is engaging in Nam Bhajan. Everybody is chanting Hari Nam. So there's really no change. The Gayatri mantras that are introduced during the second initiation process in ISKCON, in the Gaudiya Parampara, those mantras enrich our ability to develop Sambandha Tattva with Krishna, which means they increase the ability of the chanter to understand Nam. Yeah? Nam, which is Harinam, the chanting of Harinam is the goal the Gayatri mantras increase our ability to understand Krishna as Harinam. This is the purpose of the Gayatri. 
So the Gayatri itself increases the ability of the chanter to understand Krishna as the personification of Nam and to increase Sambandha. When I'm referring to Gayatri, there are so many Gayatris that a devotee chants. I'm referring to the Gayatris associated, you know, given to us for the purpose of unfolding the Nam by the Gaudiya Vaishnavas. It's, you know, we receive many Gayatris during the initiation process. So the point I'm trying to make is I'm not necessarily focusing on what we generally know as the Gayatri Mantra, which is the Tat Savitur Varenyam, Vargo Devasya Dimahi, Dio Yonaha Prajodayat. I'm not referring to that. I'm referring to the many other Gayatris that are received in addition to this one. So the whole purpose of the Gayatri is to introduce Sambandha, to increase Sambandha. And with the increased Sambandha, for us to be able to come in touch with the Archa Vigraha Rupa, the Archa Vigraha Rupa is the deity in form of the Shaligram, deity in form of Giraj, deity in form of, you know, the Radha Krishna deities whom we worship in different temples. All these deities are basically increasing our ability of being able to understand Harinam. So Srila Jiva Goswami practically focuses on the fact that for the Gaudiya Vaishnava, Harinam is everything. So there is Harinam amongst sadhus in terms of getting together and then discussing the glories of Harinam. Then there is the literal chanting of Harinam in Namasmaran and Namakirtan. Then there is a glorification of Harinam in Srimad Bhagavatam. Srimad Bhagavatam is the glorification of Harinam. And then there is the glorification of Harinam while we chant mantras worshipping the deity because even the deity is worship is basically to increase Sambandha for us to be able to understand who we are in relationship to Krishna. And that is facilitated by the chanting of the Gayatris and to increase our Sambandha. And coming to the Dham, we get exposed to Krishna's names. We get exposed to a lot of stimuli. And the stimulation that is received when in the Dham is that of sights and sounds and smells and so on that are all very much related to you know, uh, Krishna's uh, Nama Rupa Guna Leela. This is again a stimulation of wanting to chant Harinam. So the point being that we exist in the Gaudiya Vaishnava Siddhanta to chant Harinam. Harinam is our purpose. Everything else is facilitating the chanting of Harinam. Now, one has to understand that Srimad Bhagavatam has also been written in the same fashion. The first nine cantos of Srimad Bhagavatam literally remove misconceptions and remove aparads and reinforce the glories of Harinam. Only after you have reinforced the glories of Harinam and the misconceptions and all kinds of philosophical aberrations and all kinds of pre-existing notions about God and so on and so forth, everything gets smashed in the first nine cantos. And then you have the ability to come in touch with Krishna in the 10th canto. This is basically the fundamental theme of literary work and the contribution of our predecessors. This is basically how they designed to give us stimulation. They wanted us to be free of anarthas. They wanted us to be free of nama parad and seva parad. And they practically designed their work in so many different ways that some of the work is more confidential to give stimulation to those who are advanced in certain ways in nam bhajan. Please underline nam bhajan. Advanced in nam bhajan, then you come in touch with more advanced work. More advanced work is not going to help the devotee who has just started. Yeah, The devotee who has first started needs to get rid of Nama Parad, needs to get rid of all kinds of anathas. And this is basically done in the first nine cantos. All kinds of reinforcement, reinforcements are done. So this is the reason why the Acharyas, our Gurujan, the Parampara, constantly emphasize that we don't come in touch with the 10th canto unless we go through the first nine cantos. Yes, there are certain confidential aspects between the dealings of Krishna and his very confidential close associates in, in Vrindavan. But the, prompt, the point was also that if you go through the first through the nine cantos, then misconceptions go away. Nam is reinforced. Nama Prad is removed, Anartas are removed, then Krishna in his glorious Nama Rupa Gunalira, he practically dances in the 10th canto and we are able to appreciate the 10th canto as we also chant. 
So there's a great link between progression through chanting and what is being achieved through the reading of Srimad Bhagavatam, even though to a devotee, it may seem to be a little bit more analytical in the early chapters of Srimad Bhagavatam. We may even say that, you know, this is a little bit more, I would say, uh, you know, a breakdown of the universe and so on and so forth. This is all very analytical. It's a little bit more like Shankya Shastra, where they are breaking down this information. But this is removing Nama Prad. It is removing philosophical aberrations. Who is to say what is existing in our hearts? Can we really put our foot down saying that these aberrations don't exist? Maybe there are very subtle attachments that exist in the core of our existence, core of our heart, because we were exposed to all of this very heavily in previous lifetimes. So Srimad Bhagavatam and the speech of Srimad Bhagavatam, the gist which has been given and unfolding, the scientific unfolding of Srimad Bhagavatam is also being achieved to enthuse those who are chanting Harinam to go from stages of Nama Prad to Nama Bas to the pure chanting of Harinam with this, you know, Shuddha Nam. So the point which I'm trying to make here is that you will have to look at everything from the context of Nam. And we will also have to look at everything from the context of what is being achieved to facilitate the proper chanting of Harinam. And then we will also have to keep in mind that our sadhana, very fortunately, is not going to change. We are not going to change our sadhana after 20 years of Krishna consciousness. Our sadhana will remain the chanting of Harinam for lifetimes. If you do a very good job in one lifetime, it lays out a foundation for the next. And the next lifetime becomes a lot easier to make progress and then one attains the fruit, and then one practices the fruit in a subsequent lifetime. So Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur used to say that an average devotee, and then depending on what he considered an average, an average devotee would take three lifetimes. In the first lifetime, they would clear aparad, which is basically they would clear the anarthas. Now the anarthas themselves are grouped into three parts. One is called asat trishna, Asat Trishna means having all kinds of materialistic desires. This is like a gross level of materialistic desire. Wanting sense gratification, wanting to achieve things of a fruitive nature in this world. And into this is lumped even the desire for liberation. Yeah, our Acharyas, you know, have given such a low value for leaving the material universe. It is fascinating to see that the primary focus and the greatest achieving achievement of the Vedas, which is moksha, is actually lumped into asatrishna, which is a gross misidentification with what one would call a goal. So it's fascinating to see that that's considered a very low bar by the followers of Lord Chaitanya. It's a very low bar. So it's lumped into the first part, which is called asatrishna, and then you have all kinds of gross desires, people wanting to move from one planetary system to another, wanting mystic powers, wanting to leave and then be liberated so that they could basically not be affected. All of this is lumped into the same category of interference with the chanting of Harinam. So can we really say that we were not pursuing any of this in the previous lifetime? The answer is no. We can never make that statement. Most of us were probably pursuing it in the previous lifetime with full vigor in terms of a spiritual goal. So this is basically lumped as asatrishna. This is basically one compartment of anarthas in the many. And then you have the weakness of the heart, hridaya durbalya. This is after a goal is set and the devotee has chanted harinam and devotee is chanting harinam. Then in the heart of the devotee, there is a desire for fame. There is a desire for name. They want to be recognized. They want a pat in the back. And then they're envious when someone is succeeding spiritually. Yeah. This is termed as Hridaya Durbalya. It's basically a weakness of the heart because the goal is set and the devotee is chanting, but they have these weaknesses of enviousness. And this enviousness applies to spiritual um, you know, growth as well. Oh, someone is advancing. They're giving a better class than I. 
if we are not able to appreciate that, then we feel a twinge of uh, discomfort, and we also feel you know very very uncomfortable. And if someone you know goes on and matures in Krishna consciousness, Th this is enviousness that is displayed by those who are also chanting, and this is because they are still in touch with all kinds of material desires for fame and name, etc. And as a consequence, they feel that they are missing the boat. And then there is basically Asatrishna, which is gross, and then Hridaya Darbalya, which is somewhat subtle, and it, it, it kind of exists for a long time. It doesn't go away. Um, you know, it takes a little while longer than other gross desires to disappear. Yeah. Then you have the category of Seva Aparad and Nama Aparad. So these are three different branches of Anarthas, and all these Anarthas are being taken care of whilst we read Srimad Bhagavatam. It is being taken care of in terms of being addressed and philosophical aberrations are being corrected. And then we are seeing, you know, a lot of stress in terms of what is the real goal. And we are seeing a lot of stress in terms of the behavior of devotees under circumstances where they face envy from others. Like we noticed with Sri Vidura, he was thrown out of the assembly of Kurus. And then he appreciates that his being thrown out of the assembly of Kurus is nothing but a manifestation of the effect of material nature because external energy is operating in a certain way. He takes that as the cause and he also understands that material energy is but the material energy is but the energy of Krishna. So he's able to understand that ultimately it is Krishna's desire. So he accepts it. So he's able to kind of develop the humility to accept the arrangement, which is also very inauspicious. An inauspicious arrangement is being accepted. Yeah, it's such a wonderful lesson to see an inauspicious arrangement being accepted. And because he is accepting the inauspicious arrangement, Krishna is giving him intelligence to go on pilgrimage. He goes on a pilgrimage and he meets Sri Uddhava. Uddhava basically is already, he is such an exalted personality that he is directing him to Maitreya Rishi. And then Maitreya Rishi and Sri Vidura are having a conversation in this particular chapter. So we get to see how life is being processed by these great personalities in Srimad Bhagavatam. Whilst doing so and coming in touch with great personalities, we tend to practically fix our situation in the heart as well. When you come in touch with higher consciousness, then we automatically adjust our nature because when we talk about, for example, Sri Vidura accepting the inauspiciousness of losing something in life, which is practically his position, his power being thrown out and being an exalted personality at that. Yeah, he was not an ordinary person. He was an ex exalted personality. The exalted personality gets thrown out, but he's accepting it as Krishna's arrangement. Then this fixes something in our heart. This is how our anarthas get modified when we come in touch with personalities in the context of Srimad Bhagavatam. Then our chanting improves our functioning in Krishna consciousness just improves because we are coming in touch with very spiritual, very powerful impulse, which is practically there. You know, it is a part of Srimad Bhagavatam. This is how Srimad Bhagavatam is going to fix us. By the time we reach the 10th canto, we are supposed to be fixed in many ways in terms of being able to, you know, chant a little bit, you know, uh, free of offenses. This is basically what it is. Yeah, I'm just giving an example there. So now we are in this conversation between Sri Vidura and Maitreya Rishi. And again, the gist is coming up. They are practically starting from chapter one. They are again starting from the gist that was shared because he wants to lay a foundation for the readers. And this was spoken by Srila Sukadev Goswami within the seven days, yeah? which is fascinating that the gist itself was elaborated upon. And we are basically hearing the gist being touched upon in different chapters. So it's very important for us to understand context in the terms of removing Nama Parad, in terms of increasing Sambandha. That's our business. That is why we are coming in touch with Srimad Bhagavatam, which is non-different from Krishna. We also have to understand the context of being able to come in touch with the gist and understanding the gist will give us some context saying that this gist, without this gist, without the Chatur Shloki, without this foundation that is being spoken all around, then there is a tendency that we may have lost the map and we may just read the verses in the chapter and it could be a little bit out of context for us if we don't know what we're doing. So it's important for us to understand the gist from that perspective as well. 
So now again, it begins, the gist begins. So I'm going to start again with the Chaturshloki. And then I want to lay the foundation. And as we lay the foundation, we would go further. But I want the idea of wanting to remove philosophical aberrations, wanting to basically fix anarthas being our goal as we listen to Srimad Bhagavatam. Our idea of wanting to give up our own material weaknesses that are in the heart by listening to Srimad Bhagavatam. Our idea of coming in touch with these great personalities whose behavioral patterns in terms of great difficulty practically alters our thinking. You know, we need to do that. We need to basically come in touch with them and alter our processing of, you know, different events in life. So this is basically the objective. Yeah. Now, if we go to the Chatur Shloki, which is in the second canto, ninth chapter, 33, 34, 35, and 36, I just want to read it, and then we go on to the new chapter, which we are discussing. Um, this is 33. Brahma, it is I, the personality of Godhead, who was existing before the creation when there was nothing but myself, nor was there the material nature, the cause of this creation. That which you see now is also I, the personality of Godhead, and after annihilation, what remains will also be I, the personality of Godhead. Now, what is being established by the Lord in the Chatushloki is that he is the origin. There aren't any other origins. Now, this is also, if you know, recall, there's a philosophical aberration of wanting to either pursue one particular feature of the Lord versus the other. There's also philosophical aberrations or rather confusion that can occur in practically accepting Krishna's separated energies as being, you know, Krishna himself. There are philosophical confusions that can occur where one may set a goal which is far below what one can achieve with the process of chanting Harinam. So now we are looking at it from the perspective of achieving the different aspects of um, um, our goal of achieving freedom from anarthas, but understanding the gist and then watering this gist with reading of Srimad Bhagavatam on a chapter by chapter basis, and then also watering this gist of understanding with Krishna's names, Harinam. So it's Brahma, it is I, the personality of Godhead, who was existing before the creation when there was nothing but myself, nor was there the material nature, the cause of this creation, that which you see now is also I, the personality of Godhead. And after annihilation, what remains will also be I, the personality of Godhead. Now, how do you use this practically? From a practical perspective, from a practical basis, this is what Sri Vidura applied when he was thrown out of the assembly house. He practically could understand that Krishna is the origin. It is separated energy, which is the external energy, which is acting and has created circumstances that are by material calculations quite inauspicious. But accepting it as Krishna's arrangement is what Sri Vidura did. So when we are able to process events in our life on a day-to-day -day basis, when we start accepting life on a day-to-day -day basis, anything that occurs on a day-to-day -day basis as an arrangement of the Lord, even if it isn't the arrangement of the Lord, it is our karma, but we accept it as an arrangement of the Lord, then it will become an arrangement of the Lord. This is basically how we can buy an apple from the market and make an offering. And the apple that's being offered, which is material in one sense, becomes completely spiritualized. So the circumstances of life, when they are accepted as being arranged by the Lord, they become completely spiritualized. And then Sri Vidura receives intelligence in the heart of wanting to proceed on a pilgrimage, even after losing everything that he thought was his. Yeah, the position, his family, so on and so forth, he starts walking on a pilgrimage. This is basically intelligence given by Krishna. Yeah, but the fundamental root of how to accept it is being shared in the gist. So you can apply this practically as well. This is not philosophical in terms of, you know, inapplicable from a practical perspective. It is actually applicable and it is required. And this is the foundation of Trinada Pisunichena, Taro Riva Sahishnuna. This is the foundation. Trinada Pisunichena Taro Riva Sahishnuna is all about being able to accept each and every day and each and every circumstance of life as being arranged by Krishna. 
And when the philosophical understanding becomes a reality in our heart, where faith increases to meet the philosophical standard, where faith becomes an experience, and when experience exists, then one makes a lot of advancement. So this is the point we're trying to make here, is that when we take the Chatur Shloki and we water it with Harinam, then we come in touch with experiences, then what does happen is that this faith becomes very, very solid. You know, faith, when it transforms into experience, is practically a pinnacle, you see? You need faith when you do not know what you're going to experience. You need faith when you do not know what exists. But once it transforms into an experience, there's a realization of what this is, then it becomes a part of us. And this becomes very foundational for us to be able to grow further. So this is the foundation of Trinadapi Sunichena, accepting each and every day as being arranged by Krishna, accepting aspects of life as being arranged by Krishna, because you know that Krishna is the origin, Krishna is the middle, Krishna is the end. So this is being spoken here. This is the gist of Srimad Bhagavatam. Now, the next verse of the Chatur Shloki, which I want to briefly touch upon, is, O oh Brahma, whatever happens to be of any value, whatever appears to be of any value, if it is without relation to me, has no reality. Know it as my illusory energy, that reflection which appears to be in darkness. So here, Krishna is trying to distinguish that which is spiritual and that which is his external energy. He's trying to distinguish what is external energy versus what is internal potency. The first was everything is me, and then he is distinguishing what is external energy. Yeah? It has no reality. If it is not connected to me, if it is without relation to me, it has no reality. It has no reality. Know it as my illusory energy, that reflection which appears to be in darkness. Now, how does a devotee apply this in form of a gist? That if we do not have a context of wanting to desire to succeed in the gift that Srila Prabhupada has given us in terms of attaining prema, if that objective is not the main core objective, if there is no single pointed objective in life, and there are multiple objectives that we have, achieved, you know, we have kept in line, and each of those objectives have no relationship to the singular you know, objective of wanting to attain what Srila Prabhupada has given, those objectives that have no relationship to this can be associated with the illusory energy to the extent to which they can aid the primary objective of attaining premanam, wanting to be able to chant shuddhanam. To that extent, they are a part of Krishna's plan. To that extent, they are a part of Krishna. To the extent to which they are separated, then to that extent, they don't really help us. So this is basically also a part of the anartha. When we look at asatrishna, asatrishna is the, the whole concept of wanting to achieve things within the material world from a fruitive objective, from the idea of karmakanda, from wanting to achieve the fruit of results in terms of wanting to enjoy from one place to another. In other words, moving from one particular branch of the material world to another, wanting to elevate oneself to higher planets, wanting to achieve certain powers and so on and so forth. All of this is called Asat Trishna. Yeah. Now that Asat Trishna is captured in this verse. In this verse, Krishna is saying that if you find that it is not related to me, then you should know that it is my illusory energy. Now, how do we determine if it's related to him? Have a singular objective. Have a singular objective and Krishna would allow us to be able to see very clearly as to what is related and what isn't related. He will be able to see. We will be very clearly able to see what is related and what is not related. Now, verse 3. O Brahma, please know that the universal elements enter into the cosmos and at the same time do not enter into the cosmos. Similarly, I myself also exist within everything created and at the same time I'm outside of everything. So the objective of Krishna consciousness is Krishna consciousness. What does it mean? Is that qualitatively we will attain the same qualitative consciousness as Krishna. And when that happens, one can exist in this world in a material body. One can be surrounded by the material elements and yet not be affected just as much as the super soul is not affected, even it is, if the super soul is in the body of an abom abominable animal. You, know, you can find the super soul in the heart of a pig, which is basically immersing itself in filth. You can find the super soul in the heart of a great sadhu. Now, he is not affected. He is not affected by the environment. And if we attain his quality, then we don't get affected either. So 
what Krishna is particularly telling us is that if you attain the nature of spirituality, if you attain his nature, then you can exist and it won't be affected. You won't be affected as much as he's not affected. Yeah. You won't be affected as much as he won't, he's not affected. Now let's take an example. We talk about Sambandha Tattva. We talk about the fact that we want to know who we are in the spiritual sky. As one evolves in the spiritual practice, one evolves in Nam Bhajan, then once the Anarthas leave, then one comes in touch with clarity in terms of the mellow. The very mellow of connection to Krishna starts unfolding after Anartha Nivati. One begins to know whether they are associated with Krishna in Dasya, are they associated with Krishna in Sakya, are they associated with Krishna in Vatsalya, or are they assisting the maidservants of Srimati Radharani? See, the point is that these four mellows, they become quite distinct in terms of who we are after Anartha Nivirti. And then there is the opportunity of coming in touch with a guru in the spiritual sky, which means the our spiritual master can be the personality, or there could be a great personality who is in the special entourage of Krishna, who takes notice of our existence in this world and are chanting and takes basically charge of our life from that particular moment on. Yeah. Then you have the ability to understand Sambandha very deeply. Every time we chant, we remember who we are, we remember who is guiding us, and we start chanting in that particular perspective, there will be great clarity. This is not what I would call as any cloudy thought process. It's actually quite distinct. It is very distinct. The point I'm just trying to make is that once one realizes who they are in the spiritual sky, will they be affected by matter? They wouldn't. Just as much as the super soul is not affected by his presence in the heart of a hog or his presence in the heart of a dog or any you know, very, I would say, you know, animal which is densely covered by ignorance, he is not affected by being covered over or being in the presence of a very dense environment. We wouldn't be affected either because we would have established Sambandha. And as a consequence, our service, which is Abhideya, will have elements of a Sambandha. When we worship the deity, if the relationship with Krishna is established in the heart, that's very different from when it is not established in the heart. Then the deity worship becomes very profound for the simple reason that there is greater level of Sambandha. Now, are we going to be affected? The answer is no we would realize that we already have a place to go to. It's like being in a journey. It is like getting into a train and knowing that at six o'clock in the morning, you're going to get off the station, your destination, you're going to just sleep over and you wake up and you're going to be in a destination which is your permanent home. So are we going to be affected by the environment? The answer is no, the material environment does not affect such people. This is the beauty and the power of the process that's been given to us. The process doesn't change. Day one, it is Harinam. The last day, it is Harinam. In between, there is Harinam. This is all we do. Everything else is contributing to improvements in Harinam. This is basically the foundation. We come in touch with improvements. We are removing philosophical aberrations. We are removing confusion. We are removing the whole concept of succumbing to goals that are very, very low class in terms of you know, very low bars compared to the process that's been given to us. So all of these are being extinguished during the process of Anartha Nivirti when we come in touch with Srimad Bhagavatam, when we come in touch with the literature which is written by our Gurujan, written by Srila Prabhupada, you know, basically the other books, etc. The whole objective is to remove all these aberrations so that we could fix ourselves in Harina. This is what it is. Yeah, we should not be distracted in thinking that there's something else that is being presented to us. No, Lord Chaitanya's movement is all about chanting of Harina. There's nothing else being presented to us other than wanting to reach Premanam, wanting to call out Krishna's names as the residents of Raja. When they call out Krishna's names as a resident of Raja, Krishna appears. Nam and Naminoho Abhinnatum. There is no difference. 
You call out Krishna during Prema, Krishna appears. In Nama, Rupa, Gundalila, everything becomes evident. When you call out Krishna's names during the first day of Nam Bhajan, then at that point in time, Nam very mercifully is removing illusions from our heart and removing all kinds of debris. Debris that has been accumulated over millions and millions of lifetimes, covering over some which is so subtle that we can't even know what is there. It's almost difficult for us to perceive as to what has been layered on, because imagine doing something for an entire lifetime, and what if that particular activity was completely crooked? Doing that, what if that activity was completely against the idea of Lord Chaitanya's teachings? Doing that for an entire lifetime, imagine the layer of nations that has already been layered on in our hearts. We wouldn't even know that our behavioral patterns and how we process life and how we interact with devotees and all of these, we do not know where they're coming from. We just do not know. So it's important to come in touch with role models. We need to come in touch with the Srimad Bhagavatam so we can see the behavior of those who have already reached prema, who are already transcendental. And then we get to know that, yes, this is reality. This is how people live. Yeah, this is basically how it is. Then it corrects us. You know, we basically wake up and say, this can't be how we should be. We should be like them. We should process life in a different way. You see, this is basically the function. Because it is transcendental, it will stick to us. When we talk about topics that are transcendental, they have the ability to remain with us. And as a consequence, they have the ability to extinguish you know, uh, darkness because they're very dynamic. It is very dynamic. That is the beauty of Srimad Bhagavatam is that the concepts, the stories and everything else that is in Srimad Bhagavatam, because it is complete pure consciousness, it is Krishna himself, can enter into our hearts and then it can completely destroy and be very dynamically situated. It kind of establishes itself as years go by. Repeated hearing, Srinvatam on a daily basis is practically the recommended process because it removes nations, it removes the Abhadreshu part. What is Abhadreshu? Passion and ignorance. It removes it. So that's why we hear that for a pure devotee, it doesn't really matter as to where they are. That's why we hear that a pure devotee is unaffected by the circumstances and the activities they do. We hear of all of that because the Sambandha is established deep within. And as a consequence, based on the Chatra Shloki, just as much as the Paramatma is not affected, the Jivatma, which is the pure devotee who is completely pure and qualitatively one, is not affected. They're going on with their lives. Yeah? Now this is four, Chatra Shloki four is again emphasizing, saying, a person who is searching after the supreme absolute truth, the personality of Godhead, must certainly search, up, search for it up to this. In all circumstances, all space and time, both directly and indirectly. So practically, if you want to really achieve knowledge, you need to have captured all the three different aspects of Hare Krishna, I'm sorry. There was a brief disconnection and then yeah, I don't know what happened. So I'm back here. So the, we, were, we were basically saying the whole concept of Sat, Chit and Ananda is that your happiness has to be uninterrupted. So there has to be Sat. Unless we know our Sambandha with Krishna in the spiritual sky and then we understand who we are, which is Chit, and then we also understand and engage in activity, which is Abhideya, in relation to Krishna. The whole concept of Satchit and Ananda doesn't really fit in. So this is also the Chatushloki. Chatushloki practically saying, understanding Narayana to be everything, the origin, the middle, and the end, and then 
distinguishing spiritual versus material, and then talking to us about what it is to be not affected by all of this. This is basically the Chatur Shloki. Now, if you keep this context and have an understanding that you want to read chapter six of the third canto, then it would make sense as to why we are reading the third canto, because this concept of Chatur Shloki is now unfolding. The lotus of Chatur Shloki, the gist of Chatur Shloki is now unfolding. The petals are unfolding. They are being watered by Srila Sukadev Goswami. They're unfolding and they're giving us a flavor that exists beyond you know, the initial description. This is the reason why it is given. Yeah, it is said that it is said that just as much as Lord Brahma received a mantra and he chanted for a thousand years and then he had a revelation, he was able to have darshan of Lord Narayan. He received instructions and then he started acting upon those instructions. Um, mantras, initially the sages receive a sound. There are different sages who have practically given us different mantras. So, for example, the very famous Gayatri Mantra is given by Vishwamitra. And when they have to chant the Gayatri, then what they do is they receive a sound first, a single syllable seed. And then that seed is watered in the heart. And then that seed grows and then reveals the rest of the structure of the mantra, the meter and everything else. So the sage becomes a sage of the mantra. Yeah? Then you will find that he is the rishi of the mantra then he will tell you what kind of chanda or rhythm that you're supposed to use to chant the mantra. He will tell you who is the God, you know, the typical form of the deity who is worshipped in the mantra. All of this becomes revealed. So the point we are trying to make is Srimad Bhagavatam being very dynamic and the verses of Srimad Bhagavatam themselves being mantras, which reveal the nature of Supreme Krishna, which reveal the nature of Krishna. The idea is that when you receive the gist and then you water it with Harinam, then it unfolds. And then we slowly, steadily understand what the gist meant. And then we also understand the rest of Srimad Bhagavatam in context. So let's go to chapter six. Now, one moment. This is chapter six of third canto. Those of you who are with us. Yeah, this chapters entitled creation of the universal form yeah in the beginning of the second canto the universal form is described to be material but necessary for those who are neophytes so that they could progress from the universal form on to a discussion of the paramatma and then they could progress on to a discussion of the Purushas, and then they could progress on to the discussion of the various incarnations, and then they could progress on to the discussion of Krishna's pastimes. So the universal form that is being discussed here is the first step. The first step itself, which is being given here, is a manifestation which is called very important for the neophytes, and if we consider all of us as neophytes, we are all neophytes in many ways, then we can gain a few understandings. We can kind of have a deeper understanding of what is being spoken of here. Now, those of us who have already progressed on to coming in touch with Krishna and his Archa Vigraha, receiving Harinam in the lineage of Lord Chaitanya, we are actually worshiping Bhagavan, the universal form is a far more rudimentary understanding of the form of the Lord that is to be worshipped. And it is recommended for those who have forgotten Krishna. It is recommended for those who have forgotten the existence of God. So at the initial stage, Lord Brahma was asked to meditate on the universal form. He was asked to meditate on the universal form because he had forgotten who he was. He had forgotten his duties. He had forgotten, you know, where he had to go. So he was meditating on the universal form. So the point we are trying to make is that this is a very rudimentary representation in the context of those of us who are worshipping deities of Shri Sri Radha and Krishna in Lord Chaitanya's movement. However, 
this is very important for us to understand as to how closely Krishna manages the universe. It is extraordinarily closely managed. So that is very important for us to understand. And this is very important for us to understand because as chanters of Hari Nam, we are completely dependent on Nam. How do you depend on something which is not in charge of every aspect of your existence? So this is more of an intellectual reinforcement of the fact that Krishna is completely in charge and he is the beginning, he is the middle, he is the end. And this reinforcement practically increases the faith of the chanter of Harinam. They increase the faith of the chanter of the Harinam, that Nam, which is Krishna himself, is everything. And you depend on Nam for everything. This is basically to reinforce our faith and our dependence on Nam. In reality, Srila Haridas Thakur defines a sadhu as someone who is dependent on Harinam. So for in the context of a Vaishnava in the line of Lord Chaitanya, when you use the word sadhu, means sadhu is dependent on Harinam. But how do you depend on Harinam when you do not know the extent to which Harinam is practically managing every aspect of our existence? So this is more of a philosophical and more rudimentary reinforcement of the fact that every aspect of our existence is practically managed and controlled from the beginning to the end by Krishna. And by depending on Krishna's name, which is not different from Krishna, we would be able to unravel what began. You know, we don't know when we began our journey, but then how do you unravel something? You can only unravel something with power that practically is the origin. So we are practically clinging on to uh, the lotus feet of Nam and Nama basically is going to take us back. We are not going to change our sadhana. But then Nama has many expansions. One of the expansions at a very rudimentary level is the universal form. If we understand how the universe is managed by Nama, then we have the ability to reinforce our faith very deeply. Yeah, that's the whole purpose. Now let's hear this a little bit more carefully and then we will stop for questions. Creation of the universal form. First uh, verse, the Rishi Maitreya said, the Lord thus heard about the suspension of the progressive creative functions of the universe due to the non-combination of his potencies such as the Mahatattva. The Mahatattva is a lump of clay. Yeah, it is a lump of clay. And that lump of clay basically requires animation. So there's a consequence of bringing life into the lump of clay. And then the mode of passion practically allows the lump of clay to take different forms. And all of this happens due to the entrance of Krishna's potency into this lump of clay. So the Mahatattva, which is the entire, you know, I would say primary primordial matter, as we call it, primordial matter, matter which is uh, dormant. It has not been awoken yet. It's a lump of clay. Creation has not begun. Then at that point in time, Krishna's glance practically invokes consciousness, and that consciousness practically makes things move. And that is the statement that is being made here, saying that the dormancy of primordial nature is being described. The Lord has heard about the suspension of the progressive creative functions due to non-combination of his potencies, such as the Mahatattva. It's a non-combination. What do you mean by non-combination? Krishna's spiritual potency, which is life force, has to combine with Mahatattva, which is the primordial matter. And primordial matter is his external energy. It's inferior. Life force is superior. Both of these have to combine and then they interact with the modes of nature to produce different shapes. In the previous session, we spoke of the fact that when you want to differentiate something, there has to be the mode of passion. Yeah, it is the mode of passion which makes one very attached to their body. They think their body is very different from someone else's body. They think they are belonging to a certain nation. They belong to a certain category of people. They belong to a certain gender. They belong to... Uh, you know, a certain kind of uh, linguistic, uh, you know, part of the world where they speak a certain kind of language. 
And all of these differentiations come from the mode of passion because the mode of passion differentiates, it creates shapes, it creates forms. And because of this, there's a lot of differences. And then these differences themselves reinforce very heavily. So if you notice someone very deeply attached to their country, you know, we say, oh, he's a nationalist and he's very deeply attached to the country. Uh, that is the mode of passion. In reality, it is the mode of passion. It is the mode of passion. So whenever there's attachment, then you have to understand that it is the mode of passion. And whenever there's deep affection, one has to understand that that is the mode of goodness. So there's attachment and then there is affection. So if you recall, um, when there was uh, the meeting between our Srila Prabhupada with his Guru Maharaj, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur Prabhupada, the first meeting, uh, Srila Prabhupada was a nationalist. Uh, he had certain nationalist inclinations because he believed that India being under shackles of um, colonization during the early 1900s, you know, early 20th century, uh, was actually a great disadvantage. It could not really dominate culturally because the culture was being trampled upon and so on and so forth. So when he met with Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur practically emphasized a simple fact. He said, no, Krishna consciousness is more important. Don't waste your time. Go and preach the tenets of the teachings of Lord Chaitanya. That is more important than anything else. Now, what we are trying to say is that the distinction between nationalism, which practically motivates one to act based on their birth, based on their body, based on their race, etc., is very distinguished from the whole idea of Lord Chaitanya's movement, where this is a global movement. Yeah. It's a completely non-sectarian global movement. And this, is, this whole idea of sectarianism in terms of breaking everything down into parts and pieces and then identifying and misidentifying, this, all these different identities that are being formed is nothing but material nature, there's nations. And Lord Chaitanya with one stroke, with Srila Prabhupada being a senapati, being the primary general who was sent by Lord Chaitanya, motivated by his Guru Maharaj, he practically in one stroke demonstrated that in higher consciousness, you could sit across in different parts of the world and have so much in common with each other. Yeah, and we can experience it in our movement. Uh, you could just travel to a different country altogether, different continent even, and there's a certain level of familiarity with which we can interact with devotees. Yeah, there's a certain level of commonality, there's a certain level of common purpose, and all those differences just go away. There's very little mention as to which part of the world the devotee comes from. We don't really generally discuss that. You know, we kind of are definitely appreciative of the fact that the offerings made by different devotees around the world are quite distinct. And, you know, there's a certain flavor associated with different countries. And those flavors do come across in deity worship. They come across in how Krishna looks and Radharani look in terms of dressing. You can see it, actually. You can see the different flavors come through in terms of perception. But all of that is fully appreciated because, you know, they are all doing things in, from the perspective of um, worshipping Krishna and Srimati Radharani, and it is fully appreciated. So there is a lot of flavors that come, but there is no sectarianism. There really isn't a question that is being asked as to whether a devotee comes from this place and a devotee belongs here, a devotee belongs there. If that is happening in our society, then we certainly have learned nothing. Yeah, we, love, we never have learned anything if that is happening. Where if we start dividing our society in terms of where devotees come from, then we are undoing the work of Lord Chaitanya because that is nothing but material mode of passion. It is the material mode of passion which distinguishes one from another. So very important that in the beginning, Mahat Tattva, the lump of clay, there was no distinguishing. Then Krishna infused it with life energy by his glance. And by glancing into it, he bought life force and it became alive and it started interacting with the modes of nature and then different shapes and forms started coming by. The supreme powerful Lord then simultaneously entered into the 23 elements with the goddess Kali, his external energy, 
who alone amalgamates all the different elements. So this is basically the Supreme Lord entering into the different elements, essentially at different levels. As Garboda Kashai Vishnu, he enters into each and every universe, and then he lies on the floor of the universe on the Garbhodaka ocean, and even before creation, and then Lord Brahma appears from his navel, and then the whole process of creation begins. Yeah. And then from Garbhodaka Shai Vishnu, you have the Gunavataras of Vishnu, Brahma, and Shiva. It is Krishna as Shiva who interacts with external energy. And here, external energy is called Kali, because when you look at external energy, and when you look at time, as we find here in the material world, there's a destructive element of time. Eternal time does not have a destructive element. It does not have the mode of ignorance. Here, time has the mode of ignorance, and it has a destructive element. What existed before doesn't exist today. What is existing today is not going to exist tomorrow. So a manifestation of this material energy is Mother Kali, and he interacts with Mother Kali. Now, who is interacting with Mother Kali? It is Lord Shiva who interacts with Mother Kali. So the personification of the glance of Krishna, Krishna as Karanodakushai Vishnu is glancing at primordial nature. That glance personifies itself as Lord Shiva. And that particular movement, the external energy with the Krishna's internal energy becomes the external energy. And now you have both Lord Shiva and his consort, Mother Kali, practically managing the affairs of the universe. Yeah. So first there is Karanodaka Kashai Vishnu. From Sri Karanodaka Kashai Vishnu, he glances at primordial nature. That glance is personified as Lord Shiva. His consort, Mother Rama, the consort of Karanodaka Kashai Vishnu, the Lakshmi who sits at the lotus feet of Karanodaka Kashai Vishnu, her name is Rama. Rama transforms into Lord Shiva's consort, Mother Durga. A personification of Durga is Kali. So fundamentally here, we are talking about the Guna Avatar of Lord Krishna, Shiva, interacting with Kali, who is external energy, and they are practically managing the interaction of the material universe, impregnation of the material universe, etc. Because Krishna directly doesn't come in touch with material energy. Lord Shiva does. And the personification of Krishna's glance who come in touch with material energy is Lord Shiva. Krish Lord Shiva basically is the incarnation who is, he, he is not Jiva, he is not Vishnu, but he is almost Vishnu, you know, which is quite interesting. And he interacts with the external energy. That's when the personality of God had entered into the elements by his energy. All the living entities were enlivened into different activities, just as one is engaged in his work after awakening from sleep. So when there's life, then everybody is awake and they're acting. When the 23 principal elements were set in action by the will of the Supreme, the gigantic universal form or Vishwarupa body of the Lord came into existence. Now, this is a personification. Please understand this very clearly. This is not gross. This is subtle. Before there is a manifestation of gross creation in terms of planetary systems, in terms of so many different aspects of what exists in the world, in the material nature, there is a subtle manifestation. That subtle manifestation has a rupa. That rupa has many different heads, many different arms, legs, and he covers everything. This picture is seen in the 11th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. This is the universal form which is a subtle representation of material creation and Krishna's involvement and management of material creation in that particular form. So the universal form is a representation in subtle, which means it is a form of the Lord, just as much as the deity in the temple is a form of the Lord, but the universal element is universal form is a form of the Lord, the Vishwarupa, is a form of the Lord, which is a subtle representation. It exists, but it exists for the purpose of managing the material universe 
and the various activities within the material universe. Yeah. We don't worship the universal form. We do not consider it as the ultimate refuge in Lord Chaitanya's movement by the Vaishnava Acharyas, because this is a material representation, which means there's a subtle representation of a deity form that occurs before the material creation is to take place, which means how Krishna manages the material universe is also represented in the form of a deity, and that is the universal form. And why don't we basically worship in Lord Chaitanya's movement is because it has everything to do with the management of the material universe. And as a consequence, we don't really worship what is being done here. We are already being given the intimate knowledge of what occurs in the topmost Vaikuntha planet. So we are already worshiping Krishna in Goloka and the universal form is a representation of the Lord's portions. He's a representation of the Lord in how he manages the whole process of creation, maintenance and destruction. If you were to basically give the form of a deity, that's who he is. That deity form is real. That deity form is real. What do I mean by saying that's real? Krishna manifested it in front of Arjun. He wanted the impersonalists. He wanted the more neophyte uh, you know, pursuers of philosophical knowledge to understand that the two-armed form is who he is, is also the universal form. He basically wanted the, everybody to see that they are dealing with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So Krishna manifested the universal form in front of Arjuna, and that form is practically the subtle representation of how Krishna manages the material creation as the supreme time factor. That's why he says, Kalos me. He basically calls himself as time. He says, time I am. And what is the distinguishing factor of material energy? The distinguishing factor is there's going to be destruction. There's going to be destruction. What exists yesterday doesn't exist today. What exists today is not going to exist tomorrow. There's going to be destruction. So the universal form is a subtle representation. And Krishna represented this to Arjuna simply so that those who read and gain knowledge from the Bhagavad Gita can understand that he is the Supreme Lord. Because there's a tendency amongst philosophers who are not in Lord Chaitanya's line, who are not Vaishnavite, to discard the two-arm form of Krishna because they think that that is also illusory. So he basically wanted to emphasize that he is actually the origin. He is practically the middle and the end. He wanted to show that he was going to manage everything. He practically wanted to show that he's in charge because there's such confusion that is created by impersonalists because they think they are God. They also feel that Krishna's pastimes on the planet are, uh, you know, also they're part of, you know, what they do, which is the nonsense they go through is what Krishna went through. You know, this is their understanding because they think that Krishna's um, form of two arm form is practically also Maya. They think Maya controls everything and Krishna is also controlled by Maya. And Krishna wanted to show that he is in charge. He basically wanted to display the universal form. So we should understand that that is a subtle representation. So for someone who is beginning, if they want to have an understanding of how everything works, then they understand how everything works by coming in touch with the universal form, which is what Lord Brahma did. And then he progressed on to actually worshipping Lord Narayan and receiving the mantra and chanting and having darshan. So the universal form is a subtle representation of how Krishna works within the universe, but it is definitely a form. You need to understand that it has, it has a rupa. There's a rupa there. Yeah, we should really understand that it is not a philosophical uh, statement. It is not a philosophical understanding. There is a form, and it is real in terms of you know, what is being represented there. As the Lord in his plenary portion entered into the elements of the universal creation, they transformed into the gigantic form in which all the planetary systems and all movable and immovable creations rest. Uh, please understand that these are descriptions of the subtle. When there are descriptions of the subtle, it means that it is a precursor to the creation. Now they are describing the subtle, then it is a precursor 
to the actual creation that occurs so that we have a deeper understanding. And the subtle aspect of how the creation is managed and how Krishna basically manages everything and how all the demigods rest in him, all the functions of the universe rest in him. That is the Vishwarupa. The gigantic Virat Purusha, known as Hiranmaya, lived for 1,000 celestial years on the water of the universe, and all the living entities lay with him. The total energy of the Mahatattva in the form of the gigantic Virat Rupa divided himself, divided himself by himself into the consciousness of the living entities, the life of activity and self-identification, which are subdivided into one, 10, and three, respectively. Um, I'm going to take this verse from next session onwards. I'm going to take, this is somewhat analytical. It is not complicated. It is simply a little bit more descriptive. Uh, when we study books written by Srila Prabhupada for the purpose of consumption, for us to be able to act upon from a practical basis, we need to understand that the nitty gritties, the nuts and bowls, and everything that is to be in the universe is managed by the Lord. And the Lord is represented by Nam because his personal two arm form in Raja is the supreme form. Nam is a representation of that supreme form. When we're calling upon the Hare Krishna Mahamantra, we are practically coming in touch with the supreme form, the ultimate form, the origin of every other form of the Lord. We are coming in touch with that. But then how do we understand Nam in the context of how the material universe is managed, which is what Srimad Bhagavatam is trying to tell us in this chapter. Srimad Bhagavatam is wanting us to be peaceful. It is wanting us to say that you don't need to worship uh, you know, the universal form. You do not need to worship Krishna's separated energies. Come in touch with Nam. Nam is enough because Nam is the origin. This is basically what the chapter is trying to tell us. It's trying to give us knowledge as to how Krishna is in the beginning, he's in the middle and the end. And then the universal form is the first primary form. It is a subtle representation of how he manages the universe. It is real, which means that just as much as you have Karanuda Kashai Vishnu lying on Anantashesha, just as much as you have Lord Garboda Kashai Vishnu lying in the causal, sorry, the Garbodaka ocean within each universe you know, managing it, just as much as you have Shiroda Kashai Vishnu lying in the uh, Shira ocean, the ocean of milk, and he is also, you know, managing the universe as the Gunavatar, and he's the Paramatma, and so on and so forth. They all have forms. This is also a form, the universal form, Virat Rupa. And here, the entire manifestation of the material universe and how it is being managed by Krishna is represented. And it is exactly as you see it, pictured, described in the 11th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. This is the form. Yeah, that is basically what we need to understand, that this is not a theoretical concept that is being told to us. There is a form that existed. Yeah, there's a form that exists as well. Just as much as Krishna's glance into primordial matter is Lord Shiva. Yeah, that is true. This is exactly how the Bhagavatam is to be understood. Do we all believe that Lord Brahma sits on a lotus? The answer is yes, he sits on a lotus because Srila Vyasadeva saw him sitting on a lotus. This is called Tattva Darshan. Tattva Darshan means we don't speculate as to whether this is um, you know, a, some kind of a metaphor. Maybe they're giving us an analogy. Maybe there's something else. The answer is no. When Srila Vyasadeva wrote about Lord Brahma the first, you know, the secondary creator appearing from the navel of Garboda Kashai Vishnu. That is real, as real as you see your neighbors, as real as you see the second person next to you. He had Tattva Darshan. He practically saw Lord Brahma sitting on a lotus. This is a representation. He practically saw the universal form. He practically saw the manifestation of the glance of Karanadakashai Vishnu into Lord Shiva. He saw the manifestation of Mother Rama into Mother Durga. 
he saw how the different modes interact. He practically had Tattva Darshan. Do not think of this as some kind of an intellectual endeavor, which practically is superior to the intellectual endeavor that we engage in. This is Tattva Darshan. He was privy to the happenings of everything that ever took place in the universe. This is why it's called Tattva Darshanaha. This is why the Guru is called Tattva Darshanaha. Panipati and Pariprashni and Sevaya. You're supposed to worship the spiritual master who is a Tattva Darshi because he comes in a lineage of Tattva Darshis because they've all seen the truth. What do we mean by seeing the truth? Why do we have to interpret the word seeing? They have seen the truth. It's plain English. Yeah, this is the reality. So the universal form with his multifarious faces, the bodies, hands, so on and so forth. He is a worshipable form which exists and is accessed by a certain class of worshippers. He exists just as much as we know that in Goloka, Krishna exists in the two arm form. Just as much as in Ayodhya, Lord Ram exists. We know in a two arm form. This is basically the truth as being represented here. So we need to understand everything as Tattva Darshan. We need to move away from the concept of metaphors because if the Bhagavatam wants to give us metaphors, then it is clarified by the commentators. So we don't want to think that these are metaphorical. We don't want to think that these are analogies. We do not want to think of anything other than the fact that the universal form is real. It is a subtle representation. It is a deity form who manages everything. So, for example, during the churning of the milk ocean, there were many different personalities who appear. Then Lord Danvantari appears. He is holding a pot of nectar. Yeah, he is holding the pot of nectar. And he is a plenary portion of a plenary portion of Krishna. He is an avatar. He is the expansion of the expansion of an avatar. So the point being that when they say Danvantari appears with a pot of nectar, it is true. There's a description and there is a form to Lord Danvantri. There's a form to Kurmadev. There's a form to Lord Ananta. Yeah. And this is being described because Lord Srila Vyasadeva has had Tattva Darshan. The extent to which we don't use our intelligence to create confusion, to that extent, we would be given this faith. To the extent to which we are sincere in the chanting of Nam, we will also realize that Srila Vyasadeva had Tattva Darshan and there need not be any speculation on what this is all about. It is true. If she, he says that there's a glance which transformed into Lord Shiva, the answer is yes, there's a glance. He saw it. He simple, just as much as you see an event, you know, you see a bus, so you see a car, you see, you know, so many other objects moving on the street as you walk around. He saw all of this and he recorded it. That's why it's so potent. It is potent because it's real. It is potent because it is sat. There's not a shred of um, change. It is the absolute truth. It is going to remain the same. It's not going to change. It's very potent. So I'm just wanting to mention this because sometimes it becomes difficult for everyone to conceive of the deity forms of the universal form, so on and so forth. But I was wanting to say uh, that these are not descriptions that are um, fictional, metaphorical, it's real. Um, Krishna's form of the universal form is a basic form. The Paramatma is the next level of realization. And then there is the Purusha avatars who manage the universe at different levels. And then there is the incarnations who come from the Purusha avatars. Then there's Krishna himself. This is how we are going to proceed in Srimad Bhagavatam, reinforcing our faith, coming in touch with wonderful, um, you know, uh, what I would call as interaction of devotees with the different incarnations of the Lord. And then the removal of all our misconceptions in, of, which have existed in our heart for millions of years. It's all going to happen as we read Srimad Bhagavatam and we chant Nam. Okay, I'm going to stop here and I'm going to take questions today. And then we will continue further from six onwards in the next uh, session. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Is it okay if I ask a question? Yes, please. Okay, Hare Krishna Prabhu. Wonderful point you put forward and very inspirational. Um, you spoke about Sabanda, uh, Sabanda um, um, very extensively and 
it's very interesting these points that you're making um there's there's a in 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 the world we see in the world we experience today we see in within the brahman community um when it comes to like um opportunities okay, sorry, to talk about which community haribol which community sorry. please i'm sorry i missed that Bra brahmanas brahman communities okay. mm -hmm. yeah um and yes um they are obviously they come from a mayavadi perspective but they speak from bhagavad gita and um uh they allude to mukti bhakti mukti bhakti and siddhi as the mm. conclusion of all these things which unfortunately is very misleading and does not create um does not enthuse an individual to take up to devotional service so what can be done in terms of those that are practicing krishna consciousness from the from from a sampradaya point of view or, or from um especially from a gaudiya sampradaya point of view what can be what can be done to to ensure that this this and in, and when i'm talking about misleading it sometimes happens on mass unfortunately as well so um what can be done in terms of looking at um changes to this kind of situation yes um uh, actually very good question uh, yeah the, the, uh, if you're finished uh then the answer is that um this is basically very foundational in terms of the entire purpose of the gaudiya vaishnava preaching shila bhaktivinod thakur emphasized the fact that if you remove the offensive portions from the other sampradayas and the other upper sampradayas all the different rivers of philosophies will flow to the ocean of lord chaitanya's philosophy the idea is to remove the misconceptions the misconceptions which is nothing but nama prad just understand it from the context of what we have been speaking of yeah nothing but nama prad because if you have misconceptions then you have nama prad yeah you have misconceptions then you have anarthas you have nama prad you have goals that are um, you know subpar uh, goals that are far different from the goals being set by nama and there is nothing but nama prad if you have philosophical um what do you call as uh, confusion and offensive portions so shila bhakti vinod thakur basically talks about the fact that if you remove the offensive portions then all these different rivers will flow to the ocean of the holy name which is the whole purpose of our movement this is the whole purpose of the literature produced by shila prabhupada is to remove the offensive portions so we need we need as as uh, uh, devotees of the movement as chanters of hari naam we need to ingrain ourselves with this philosophy we need to understand why we need to understand that our purpose is to chant and our purpose is to give shuddha nam to the world our purpose is to make sure that the whole world chants hari naam then how do we preach so that we can remove the offensive portions what is it that we can do to reinforce you know the the uh, the idea of them being able to align themselves and there are different ways to do it so what i'm saying is that if we are very sincere in removing our anarthas and if we are very sincere in removing our offenses and we are able to chant shuddha naam then nama will empower us to practically carry the message of lord chaitanya and spread the mission to different parts of the world in very powerful ways and completely kind of help in removing all these misconceptions because this is the whole purpose of our movement this is the gaudiya vaishnava purpose the gaudiya vaishnava purpose is to remove the offensive portions that are particularly offensive because they commit nama parad and because of nama parad they are excluded you see this is the reason that is all that is the point so what i'm trying to say is that this is very fundamental to our um, future this is very fundamental uh, so when we prepare for our classes when we want to speak to someone then we want to speak and we want to share in such a way that we are focused in wanting to assist the class we want to assist the group of devotees we are addressing to remove nama prad as each and every devotee in our movement who is chanting nama becomes powerful by removing aparad then they have the ability to help a similar group of people who are committing so in this way the movement will spread for sure 
because this is the prophecy of Lord Chaitanya that everybody would be chanting. So the point is that this is going to happen, but there needs to be an understanding, a very clear understanding that our business is to first remove our anarthas, and then we are supposed to become, as we would call it, the lightning rod that lights another. And then we speak with the singular purpose of removing Nama Parad. We speak with the singular purpose of you know, ensuring that the offenses are removed. And then we have the ability to enthuse a vast number of people to move forward. This is the purpose. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that um, this is a more fundamental question. This is a very fundamental question. This is exactly what we're supposed to do. This is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to constantly meditate on how to reach there. Yeah. And, and the other part is that there are people who are quite innocent. Most of the world has no philosophy. We are not in Vedic times. Most of the world has no philosophy. There are a few with philosophy and they themselves are quite confused. So if you actually notice, nobody has the ability to be very strong even in impersonalism. <laughs> Nobody is. So if our Nama chanting, if Harinam is very powerful, if Prasadam is very powerful, then we will conquer their hearts very easily. Very easily, actually. Thank you. Thank you for very inspirational. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Sure. Hare Krishna. Yes. Um, I guess I'll take a question from chat. Um, what is exactly meant by the internal energy and external energy of the Lord? The internal potency of the Lord is the potency that allows him to unite in association with his devotees. This is yoga maya. Yoga means, means coming together. What is the potency of the Lord? What is the energy of the Lord which brings the devotees in touch with the Lord and allows them to interact and allows them to develop a deeper bond with him. That is yoga maya. That is the internal potency. Yeah, because that is how he wants to interact with each and every one of us. And the external energy is the energy that manages the material universe. And part of the external energy is the mode of passion and ignorance. The mode of passion and ignorance completely cover our ability to understand that we are a part and parcel of the Lord. It prevents us from coming to wanting to come in touch with him and wanting to interact with him and wanting to serve him. So that is a very fundamental distinguishing factor. Yeah. So the souls are considered to be marginal. The reason is that we are minuscule. And as a consequence, we are on, I would say, we are on the wall and we can jump on either side. If we have a desire of wanting to experience coming in touch with the Lord and serving him, as intended and wanting to interact with them, which is what the yoga maya potency does, then the yoga maya potency brings us in touch with appropriate mentors. It brings us in touch with appropriate literature. It brings us in touch with Sambandha Tattva. It allows us to come in touch deeper, in a deeper level with the Lord. If on the other hand, <clears throat> we don't have such an intention, but we want to associate with the separated energies and we want to specifically drown in the passion and ignorance that is dominating this world, then we are definitely dominated by the external energy. And passion and ignorance cover our intelligence. They make us forget everything. So we are more body conscious. We start identifying with the body. We start identifying with the gender. We start identifying with the nation. So the different kinds of groups that are forming in the present day, they're all nothing but different levels of passion and ignorance which are separating them from the Lord himself. So are the souls of the living entities part of the internal energy? Qualitatively, yes, but they're marginal because they're quite minuscule, so they can fall on either side. If so, Durga herself will have a soul, yet she's called the external energy. Mother Durga is Shakti Tattva. She is the potency of the Lord. Yeah. We should not equate her with Jiva, Neither should we equate her with the Lord. She is the potency of the Lord. So we cannot really put her on the same level as us. No, she isn't. Yeah, she is the potency of the Lord. Imagine this, Krishna expands as Shiva. His consort, Mother Rama, expands as Durga. So in one sense, they are non-different. Yeah, they're expansions of the Lord himself. These are avatars and expansions in the Shakti of the avatar. So we can't really equate her 
on the same level as a jiva. She manages the external energy. She manages it efficiently, just as much as you know, um, organization has different departments. She is in charge of a department. Doesn't mean that she has the qualities of the department. Can you explain further on taking everything as Krishna's arrangement? I'm going through lots of trouble at family and it was helping me to think more about Krishna. But slowly these days, it is making me not to practice Krishna consciousness. Now I have to chant hiding, etc. I'm more worried about my daughter with whom I'm unable to speak about Krishna at home. All this because my wife does not believe or like ISKCON. Could you suggest how I can overcome this problem if time permits? Um, yeah, I, why don't I do this? I know that we are in touch and I will get in touch with you uh, via WhatsApp. Um, you, you know, you've already written to me and I haven't had an opportunity to get to it, but I will surely reach out. Uh, sorry, I will reach out via email and via WhatsApp, whatever mode is convenient. Um, in terms of um, uh, chanting and hiding, etc., cetera, um, um, and I'm just sharing this, not so much to lighten the circumstances that you are in, not so much to minimize the difficulties that you're going in, going through, but just wanting to share that um, I totally appreciate what you're doing, which means that you are somewhat accepting the circumstance. You're not wanting to break out or rather break down completely, but are trying to adapt and chant and still want to faithfully chant Harinam. My spiritual master, his Holiness Bhakti Teta Maharaja. Um, when he was uh, a brahmachari, his main area of preaching was Eastern Europe. He was actually preaching in Eastern Europe. He was preaching in Russia and different parts of uh, the communist uh, bloc those days when the communist bloc was real. And he was a black man, which means the color of his skin was black which was quite unusual to be found in Eastern Europe those days. And he used to say that there used to be traffic accidents when he used to be found on the road because people had never seen someone like him before. Children used to throw stones at him because they found him quite curious. And this was an exalted uh, devotee of the Lord. In other words, you know, he was a preacher. He's one of the most, uh, I would say, prominent preachers who, who served under Srila Prabhupada, very prominent, very wonderful uh, preacher. And during that point, he used to travel by train from one place in Eastern Europe to another. And during the train journey, uh, the secret police, you know, whatever the secret police was based on the country that they were in, they used to be after him. They used to want to basically arrest him so he used to hide in the bathroom and sometimes train bathrooms because, you know, they don't get cleaned as much as anything else. It used to be in a bad condition. He used to hide in the train bathroom, a moving train, and he used to continuously chant Harinam. This is all he used to do because he was not in touch with devotees. He could not. He was preaching alone. There was no temple. There was no deity. For prashadam, he used to eat raw vegetables. And he used to distribute Srila Prabhupada's books in the universities of Eastern Europe in those days. So the point I'm trying to make is that there are lessons to be learned from those who served Srila Prabhupada before us. They went through a lot of struggle just to help Srila Prabhupada in his preaching. And which means, you know, Srila Prabhupada basically helped them because he allowed them to be a part of his mission. So sometimes when you're struggling to chant Harinam due to material circumstances, you should understand that Nam is more powerful than your circumstance. And it appears that Krishna is giving you some unique experiences. So stay faithful to Nam and try your very best to chant and be faithful to Nam. What will happen is that Krishna will reveal his plan and he would also make changes. So this is quite unique. But I will reach out to you. I haven't forgotten this uh, circumstance. Um, you just mentioned the word, if prasadam is powerful, 
we offer boga with whatever insignificant love and devotion we have how do we know of what we are offering the lord is pleasing to him um yes it is actually a very important uh, question uh, prasadam the more care that is taken in chanting greater would be the ability to cook prasadam which is cook boga the boga becomes delicious based on how the cook is chanting and how the cook is arranging how the vegetables are purchased and what kind of environment exists and then everything is really first class then it can be offered and that is accepted by the deities when that is accepted by the deities then that prashadam becomes very potent in you know practically purifying the tongue so that the holy name can dance so this is very important for us to understand that prasadam is an integral part and perhaps the most significant part if you look at the activity we all perform on a day to day basis uh, we eat at least three times a day you can just imagine that eating constitutes an enormous amount of time it constitutes an enormous amount of the division of labor the activity and everything else and then eating is done and if eating is coming in touch with very spiritualized um uh, you know uh, food which is offered to krishna which is accepted by him it has the ability to give faith so how do we know that krishna is accepted we should we may never know we may never know however what we do know is what efforts we have taken in making the boga we are fully aware of what has gone in in the preparation of the boga we are fully aware of how the offerings are being made and how uh, how much care is being taken i want to describe uh, uh, a situation um, years back years back i'm talking about when i was in grad school um, i used to be a part of the hartford temple in connecticut and there was uh, mother jeeva and uh, prabhu they used to basically they are prabhupad disciples uh, mother jeeva was very very particular about prasadam they had jagannath deities in hartford and at that point in time uh, she used to take so much care in practically making the sunday feast to such an extent that she wouldn't even allow everybody to come and participate unless you are initiated and you have chanted and so on and so forth she would not allow you to come and participate in the making of the feast she would not she basically would do everything even though she was quite incapacitated she would practically make a very elaborate and amazing amazing feast she used to make a very very amazing sunday feast and it used to be very post it used to be very potent she used to basically do everything herself simply because she wanted to offer everything with the highest standard to shila prabhupad and to the deities um, and then you will find that the kitchen standards and everything she used to maintain used to be very strict now this is not because she did not have compassion in fact she was very soft natured and very compassionate and she used to engage everybody but when it came to cooking of boga she used to be very very careful in how it was done and how the devotees who participated had sadhana done and everything she was very strict about it and what came out used to be very wonderful prasadam so i was just wanting to give an example that we really wouldn't know if krishna has accepted but we surely know if we have put in extra efforts so our movement is completely dependent on purifying the tongue and allowing krishna's names to dance this is our movement it's very fundamental so if we start ignoring purifying the tongue then the dancing of krishna wouldn't occur it wouldn't really occur naam would not occur damn naam will not dance so i was just wanting to say that that's what we need to focus on focus on the steps and then uh, you know make the devotion improve upon it and then then there can be wonderful results okay can, can you explain if my understanding is correct krishna is the only purusha and everyone is prakriti so even though we are a soul 
it's still female. And our aspiration is also becoming a maidservant of the elevated manjaris of Radharani, the gift that Mahaprabhu wants to give us. Okay, now I want to be very clear on Purusha and Prakriti. This is basically bhav. Purusha bhav is to enjoy. Prakriti is to be enjoyed. Purusha bhav is the enjoyer. Prakriti is to be enjoyed. So in that sense, the extent to which we are purushas, where we want to enjoy, we are actually in the opposite end of the spectrum. So this is not so much about everybody being feminine and masculine. It has more about wanting to enjoy versus wanting to give enjoyment to Krishna. This is a very different concept. So for as far as devotees are concerned, our whole sadhana is about reducing the whole concept of wanting to enjoy. So this Purusha Bhav can exist in feminine bodies, it can exist in masculine bodies. The idea of wanting to enjoy can exist in women, it can exist in men. And we are trying to give up that idea of wanting to enjoy and instead wanting to focus on giving pleasure to Krishna. So that is the difference between Purusha and Prakriti, not so much a matter of being females in the eternal realm of Goloka. Yeah, even the Sakas of Goloka, the cowherd boys of Goloka, they do not ask their mothers to prepare foodstuff which they enjoy. They ask their mothers to prepare foodstuff which Krishna enjoys. And they pack up and they go to the forest to meet with Krishna. This is Prakriti. This is the idea of wanting Krishna to enjoy. That is what is being broadcast in our scriptures. Not so much a matter of the body or uh, you know, even manjaris and sakas, etc. Everybody in Braja is Prakriti. Everybody wants Krishna to enjoy. That's all they want to do. Yeah. Lord Balaram has no enjoyment. Even though we see him having his own rasa dance, he is not enjoying. His only enjoyment is in giving pleasure to the Lord. This is basically who he is. So even Balaram, who is the first expansion and who is basically... The, the concept of Sevaka, Sevaka Bhagwan, is displaying the idea of Prakriti, where he wants to give the opportunity of enjoyment to Krishna, and thereby he enjoys and he feels very happy. That's basically the idea. That's why he never allows Krishna to step out. Yeah. He practically never allows the whole potency of Sandini, of Sat, of maintaining the eternality of the spiritual sky, the whole potency of even Krishna's body, the concept of Krishna's body is Balaram's potency. Sat is Balaram's potency. Eternality is Balaram's potency. Krishna's body is Balaram's potency. This is basically how Balaram is managing everything. And this is Prakriti. He's practically wanting Krishna to enjoy. Yeah, so we should understand the difference. All right, so we'll stop here. Is there any other question that anybody wants to ask that I missed? Prabhu, I have a question. My obeisances. Yes, Haribo. Um, Prabhu, I'm sorry, I joined a little bit late. Um, um, next time I'll try to be on time. Don't worry, don't worry at all. Yeah, go ahead. I'm still in India. So my question is, I attended like some yoga class and some others. Now, Everywhere there is mantra. In London, you only have the Maha Mantra. You go to the temple, there is no other temple. So you kind of... My question is Namam Prad. So when you go to, for example, a yoga center and they're doing yoga and you participate, there is a mantra that they chant. And this is quite prevalent. Um, obviously, uh, we've taken Diksha. So Harinam, Harinam Maha Mantra is the only mantra that you hold to your heart and you chant. Uh, my question is, Will I be causing offenses by, or is it Krishna's energy and that mantra is also okay? Or because you've given Maha Mantra, that's the mantra that you hold on? Okay. Uh, the first point is um, chanting, for example, a mantra in, a, in the context. Say, for example, you find in the Brihad Bhagavatam, Sri Narad Muni is walking into Kailash. He's walking into Shivaloka. Harihara Loka, he is walking into the company of Lord Shiva, who is engaging in rapt worship of Lord Sankarsana. At that time, Sri Narad Muni is chanting the mantra, Om Namo Bhagavate Rudraya. Mm. Yeah? 
So he is basically glorifying Lord Shiva as he walks in. And even though Narad Muni at all times is found to chant the names of Lord Narayan, basically, but in the context, he was glorifying Lord Rudra, who is Lord Shiva. So the point is that Aparad is when we have misconceptions on the superiority of the personalities. No, there is First no and foremost, understand that. Yeah, so the point I'm trying to make is Aparad is done when there is a misconception in whose names you're chanting and their relative importance in terms of Krishna's names. This is when Aparad gets done. Yeah, so mm -hmm. Krishna's names are non-different from Krishna and Krishna is the origin. This is the whole idea. But then if you go down and bow down to Lord Shiva, and if you bow down to Mother Durga, you know, this is, you know, if you're having a class, for example, years back, around 20 years back, uh, there was a very big uh, pandal program in America. And then Lord Shila, uh, Shila Radhanath Maharaj had come. And then Radhanath Maharaj, as he walked in, uh, it was in the context because it was a Durga Mandir. So the first thing that he did, even before coming into the Pandal program, is walk in and pay respects to Mother Durga and to Lord Shiva, who are there in that particular temple. Then he walked in and gave class. Now, the point I'm just trying to make is when you go there and you want to glorify them and you want to basically call upon them in certain ways, and if you do so with knowledge of who they are in the context of relationship with Krishna, then it is perfectly fine. Yeah. So what I'm saying is Namaprat doesn't occur just by calling upon someone by their name and if you understand where the context is, that is the only clarification I wanted to offer because you know there can be many different circumstances, but I was wanting to just clarify on this part. Okay, thank you, Prabhu. Makes sense. So by me chanting along with them, you're not causing any offense, you, you but you still understand Mahamantra and you you know you follow that. Um yeah. I, I, I... Yes, yeah, we do, and then at the same time, you know what we shouldn't do as Vaishnavas. Uh, who especially you are initiated is never take initiation receive mantras from others no, that no, will no. surely yeah what i'm saying is it will spoil our initiation yeah if the understanding is not there it is the understanding say for example if i were to say um, you know the name of lord shiva then in my heart i understand who he is in the context yeah. of lord krishna so there really isn't a faith that is passed on by me to someone else who is hearing me speak of Lord Shiva being superior, etc. Because in my heart, I know who he is in the context of Lord Krishna. I know his name versus Krishna's names. I know the function, what he does, etc. The point I'm trying to make is, in the company of Vaishnavas, we will read the entire fourth canto glorifies Lord Shiva. Mm -hmm. Krishna says in the eleventh canto that, you know, if anybody offends Lord Shiva, they can never approach him. Mm -hmm. So basically, Lord Shiva is considered very dear. He is the Param Vaishnav. So what I'm trying to say is, that just by glorifying Lord Shiva, we are not committing Namaprat, you see? We are actually glorifying a Param Vaishnav. So that's what we are doing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the clarification. Sure. Okay. Hare Krishna Prabhu, uh, uh, thank you for the class. Uh, is sure. it okay? Am I too late to ask the question, Prabhu? No, no, you are not. I think Hema Gopika wanted to ask a question and she okay. is not fast, fast enough. Maybe we'll give her a chance and then you could ask next. Is yeah, it okay? Sure. Sure. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. I, I can't hear you, Mataji. Can you speak up a little bit, please? Uh, are you able to hear now, Prabhuji? It's a little better. It's still bad, but go ahead. I can hear you. Okay, okay. Uh, I mean, you were in your uh, session just now, you were specifying that Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur Maharaj uh, always tells like for an average devotee it takes three lifetimes uh, to approach Krishna uh, the first was clearing Aparada and it was like three stages you said and how about the second and third lifetimes Prabhu can you please explain that a bit sure the first lifetime is when you complete Anartha Nivirti the next lifetime you go from Anartha Nivirti to Bhava the third lifetime Bhava becomes condensed into prema. Okay. Okay, Prabhupada. Thank you so much. And then sure. uh, I have one more question probably I will ask later, Prabhu. Sure. You can possibly write on chat if possible because uh, the voice is a little bit uh, not very clear. Sure. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Nitai Mata Mataji. 
Okay, uh, Pablo, uh, you did mention about like someone is doing you now a speeching and it's very subtle. There could be envy, you know, thinking, oh, why can't I do it? If that happens, mm. it is, it, um, uh, and uh, actually, uh, a wonder what he had really stopped preaching that because that was happening. And uh, how much of uh, you try to explain to the devotee, don't worry, there are people like that, but please come back to preach, say like that. But he is not able to make his mind up to come back. He's so hurt. And even, uh, this is not in this country, basically. And uh, so what is the reason, Prabhu? Why? And he's, he's such an amazing devotee. And well, everybody understands that is just because of the envy the other person did all that, the other devotee. But he can't somehow come back. What is stopping him, Prabhu? I want to understand what yes. happened to him. Yeah. I, I see, I think I may not be able to be very specific about what is happening to that devotee. Yeah. But what yeah. I can say is I can give a much broader approach. The broader approach is to keep in touch with the devotee. To we visit the devotee, keep in touch with the devotee, um, you know, kind of visit them, you know, different people of the Sangha, different devotees of the Sangha can constantly keep association so that the devotee doesn't feel left out. Because one of the things that happens is that they may just never, um, we all get so caught up with uh, thinking what we are doing in terms of, you know, day-to-day -day preaching and so on and so forth, that we may not pay attention to people who are hurt and who have just moved away briefly. So it is important for him to keep in touch with devotees of the Sangha. So there can be visits which are very good intention of wanting to encourage just to find out how they are, etc., so that they don't feel that they have been forgotten. Then quickly, at some point, they will also be able to come back. That is the point I'm trying to make. That should be the approach. Uh, Prabhu, actually, everything is right. Everybody is going. He is saying, what he is saying, uh, I need time. I need time. I just want to concentrate deep on my sadhana. I need time. It has passed one and a half years now. Still, he's saying he needs time. Um, what did, uh, we, uh, 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 when I heard that, I really wanted to understand. And such an elevated soul, uh, is it is he finding it difficult to forgive, or what is going on? I just wanted to understand before how. Well, do I, I, <laughs> yeah. yeah, if I yeah. No, no, I understand your concern. I think it is not so much a matter of difficulty to forgive, but I think if someone says they want time, then it's better to just give time. <laughs> That's what we should do. Give can time. This happen Let them also, come back when they're supposed to. Can Sorry? this happen, Prabhu, if somebody is doing so much preaching and cultivated so many devotees, so uh, like uh, who has taken shelter, who has taken initiation, such person also can be affected like this, Prabhu? This is my, I yes. just want to understand that. <laughs> yes, they, yes, they can. Yeah, it can. But we have to realize that, yes, it can happen. Uh, material energy is very powerful. This is the reason why, in the beginning of the class, I said, we really do not know what's going on in our hearts in terms of the anarthas, what is coming and how, what kind of hills we have to climb. We don't know. We are not very clear yet, yes? So anything can happen in that particular particular perspective. So our response has to be, that we keep in touch and give time, and then we see how things work out. Because genuinely, sometimes they may just need some time, and then they would be able to come back. This is basically what you need to do. I would do. Yeah. The okay. point is that if you do not, if you, if the point is if you do not know what is happening, we shouldn't try to fix it. That's the only point I'm trying to make. It's better to give time is the point, and the safe approach is to constantly give some association so that they feel comfortable they feel connected and they feel that okay there's love coming through and everybody still wants them back etc that's very important basically okay Babu. yeah thank you Babu. Sure. all right so i don't see any other question oh there is one okay one moment Yeah, uh, it's quite difficult to understand when an action is needed to be taken and when not. How can we understand when we accept something as this, 
is it in more of ignorance or is it accepting as karma and faith? Is it a duty or responsibility to act on some situation or accept as karma and arrangement of the Lord? Uh, well, uh, the, the, the approach given in the Bhagavad Gita, the approach given by Shastra and that which is demonstrated by different devotees is for us to basically accept it as Krishna's arrangement. But then we also need to act upon the circumstance to the best of our ability. Both need to be done. So we can't really say that this is Krishna's arrangement and then we allow Krishna basically to do whatever changes they have to be done. We basically accept it as Krishna's arrangement, but then we also make a determination to see how best can we improve the circumstances. The results may come, they may not come. That is where our humility counts. But we accept the circumstances and we treat circumstances of life as if they are dependent on us, but having the knowledge that Krishna is ultimately the arranger and he basically is going to give results. The results are controlled by him. It's actually a very fine balancing act. And this is basically done you know, so that we basically do what is required at all times and also depend on and understand that it's Krishna's arrangement. This is regarding enviousness in the spiritual platform. Hridaya Daurbalya. How will we know if we are developing such tendencies at heart? And if at all we know that we are developing such tendencies, how should we protect ourselves? Um, enviousness and other weaknesses of the heart, we will be able to see it as we evolve in our chanting. And if we are very sincere, we will be able to see the nonsense that occurs in our heart. It'll be quite clear. This is basically what Ch you know, Lord Chaitanya sings about Cheto Marjana Darpanam. Yeah? The mirror of the heart as it cleanses, we will be able to see more clearly as to what is transpiring and what is happening, etc. We will be able to see it. And then we can offer prayers and we can also understand our nature that basically we need to cleanse ourselves. This is basically how we can move forward. We can offer prayers, which is what our acharyas have done. Um, you know, particularly there is a prayer, which is the five verses glorifying Lord Narasimha Dev by Bhaktivinoda Thakur. You should Google the five verses glorifying Lord Narasimha Dev, um, and you should read those five verses. Those five verses are most apt for devotees. And we can protect ourselves with the help of Lord Nasimadev and prayers. All right. So I think we have had um, uh, somewhat of a longer session. Um, if there are any more questions, please do communicate to me via WhatsApp. I'll be happy to answer those. And we'll end today's session. We'll continue again in the following week um, in our discussion of Chapter 6 of Canto 3. Hare Krishna, all glories to Srila Prabhupada.